Hey y'all, happy Sunday, hope everything is going well for you and yours. This is the portion of the show where we let YouTube send out the notifications via social media, let folks know that the broadcast is getting ready to start. We'll sit here and we'll count down the next two minutes before I push that button and go live. If you happen to be watching this on replay, go ahead and scrub past this graphic until you see my smiling face. If you have any questions and you're joining us today in the live chat, feel free to go ahead and add those questions to the live chat now and we'll get to them in due course during this live Q&A session. So sit back, relax, grab a beverage, and we'll get going in about 30 seconds. Hey y'all, happy Sunday. Hope everybody's doing all right. Hope everybody survived the, uh, what are they calling it? I don't know if they're calling it the snow apocalypse or snowmageddon or whatever it is. It's funny. Whenever snow falls east of the Mississippi, it's a dire emergency. But out here, meh. Uh, <laughs> in fact, Les Clemens wants to know, is it white in White City? No, it's wet in White City. Uh, this is Oregon. Southern Oregon, uh, we sit down low in a valley, and uh, we're sitting at about 1,300 feet uh, above sea level, so we don't get a lot of snow. We, uh, very, very little snow. It, it's in the 40s, but we do get a lot of rain. So, it's wet, it's uh, foggy, and it's not warm at all, but you know, what can you do? Uh, now, you go up in elevation, they're getting snow. <laughs> but that's fine. I like snow in the mountains because if I really, really decide I have to be in it, I can go get into it. And it's not a mess here in town. So, okay, uh, this is a follow-up um, to this morning's video. And I hope folks weren't too disappointed. Um, I basically kind of went over a few things to prepare that image. Um, I, I was asked on Facebook, do I really plan on carving that and pouring that as an epoxy inlay? I was still kind of on the fence about it, but I've decided, yeah, I'll go ahead and do it. I'm going to, uh, probably not that size though. I am going to go ahead and carve it and do, uh, that'll be my first multicolored epoxy inlay. So, you know, um, it's going to be a learning adventure for all of us if you follow it, uh, because simply put, I've never done it before. So it'll be, um, and I, I will show it whether it works or not. If there's an issue that uh, with the epoxy or with my uh, my techniques or anything else, uh, you'll see it. I won't edit any of that out or scrap the idea because it didn't work. I will show it whether it works or not. And then go investigate as to what went wrong, what happened. So um, now this is not going to be 
a sequential, well, it will be sequential, but it won't be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The episodes won't be happening one after another. Um, in meaning that this week I did this and next week I'm going to do something else on it. I've got a bunch of other videos lined up that I'm in the middle of shooting. So it's going to be kind of, um, um, every second, maybe third video will be on this project. Um, another thing to think about is, uh, temperature and simply, um, Simply put, uh, I've got other projects that are going on. I've had a quilt rack back here for weeks. I'm just finally getting to. I've got to get it. Uh, I've got to spray the top coat on it, which means I have to wait for a little bit warmer because I have to take it outside to shoot it. I can't, I'm not going to shoot it in here. So, well, anyway. Um so I've got other projects that are going on and I've got other videos. So it's not going to be one right after the other. Not only that, we're talking about supply chains. Um, I uh, ordered the bits that I need to carve this and they should be here Tuesday. And I need to try them out and make sure everything is okay on that. Then I'll start carving. So. Uh, the next video on this is going to be on, um, uh, I'm debating, um, next week, what, or excuse me, next video, I should be able to overlap all of the vectors the way, uh, Shane and Rob described in the live stream featuring them. And then do the tool pathing. So that I'm going to try to combine all that into one video. Unless it runs way, way, way too long. If it does, I'll split that up into two videos. Um, today's video, as I said, I hope folks weren't too disappointed. It was kind of a refresher on um, the... Uh, uh, bitmap trace and node editing because, well, like the technique of group selecting points, that is, uh, Michael um, Mazalik may know this. I didn't know it. The oldest copy of the software I have on any of my computers is version 8.5. So I don't know exactly when they added that feature where you could select more than one point at a time. So that was totally new to me. I had seen it mentioned just kind of in passing in somebody's video, but it's not one of those things that it's, it's not really worthy of its own video. He says after he made a video on it, now that I think about it, but if you don't know it's there, you don't, you don't realize it. I mean, you don't know where to look for it. It's not something that's featured or talked about. And there's a lot of little things like that in the software. Now, when I group selected those vectors and then hit the S uh, keyboard shortcut to uh, smooth them all, that's not the only thing you can do with them. I mean, you can reposition them. Um, and I'll, I'll show that in the overlapping, um, in, in, when I talk about overlapping and why and how to overlap these vectors in, you can move these vectors or excuse me, these points you can, um, obviously there's some things you can't do, like you can't make all of them a start point, but there are a lot of the modifications that you can do to more to one more than one point at a time. And like I said, that's just not something that's ever really discussed. So I thought, well, let me throw that in and uh, show a few things. Uh, Bill Stoffer says, so the Gatton is trammed and ready to go. No, it's not, but it will be by this afternoon. That's what I'm going to do 
when we're after we're finished live here. Um, and yes, I'll be shooting video. I've got cameras out here and getting ready, rare to go. Okay, uh, Michael Mazalik says, I think it's always been there, not sure. Yeah, I started using VCAR Pro version 7.5, uh, the trial edition. The first, the first version that I purchased a license for was VCAR Pro 8.0. And I did not know that you could highlight more than one point. So all this time I've been doing things one point at a time and really, really bogging things down. It's just crazy. I mean, it's just nuts. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's see here. We've got, um, we do have a few uh, questions. And let's see here. Let's go back up towards the top. If anybody has any questions on today's episode or the whole um, epoxy inlay thing or V carving or what have you, let me scroll back up and see. I think there was a question up here. Okay, that's off topic. I'll get to that just next, Bill. Bill Gray. I'll get to that next. I did have one question. It was a comment on the video. The person asked about understanding wanting to keep those sharp angles. But then they asked, because you're using a round router bit, isn't it going to round off that angle anyway? And the quick answer without getting into tool pathing or anything, the quick answer is no. It's not going to round off that angle because I'm going to be using a V-carved toolpath. And that's one of the advantages of a V-carved toolpath is square corners. So that's not going to be an issue. Uh, I will use a uh, probably a quarter inch end mill for my clearance. I'm not certain yet. And then the uh, 15 degree V-bits that I have on order. That's subject to change. I may end up using a 30 degree. I'm just going to, I'm going to test and we'll see what happens. I may not need a 15 degree. It just uh, is going to depend on the level of detail. Preview early, preview often, and we'll see what happens. Um, but again, that'll be down the road in, uh, in the next video. And I'm not 100% sure when that next video is going to be. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Joe says, then do you use V-carved bits for all epoxy inlays? I won't say all. It's going to depend on what the inlay is. Obviously, if you are, let's say you're carving out a circle that's about a uh, half an inch, eh, let's say 12, 13 millimeters uh, thick. And you have, so you have one circle inside, another circle outside. It's, I won't say not necessary. Yeah, I'll say it may not be necessary to V carve that. You might be able to just do a pocket and um, go ahead and pour your epoxy in that. But when you're talking about something with multiple colors or something that has some intricacy to the pattern or you have like a uh, script font or any kind of artwork that starts out narrow and goes wider and then goes narrow again, a V-bit would be the, the better way to go. So uh, let's go back up here to Bill Gray's question. And this is, um, it's off topic, but that's okay. I've got it all ready and raring to go. It says here, if you get a second, can you explain how you adjust the feed rate while carving? Watch one of your videos this week. Help me a ton. Thank you. Well, thank you. In the video, you set the feed rate low and said you could increase it later. Yes. Um, you do need to know though, Bill that I use Mach 3 as my controller software. You would, what you would want to do 
is either talk to your machine manufacturer or talk to the publisher of the software. Now, it's not unique to Mach 3, as uh, Bob just said. It, it, there are a lot of different controllers that will let you increase or decrease the speed as it's cutting. Um, do a quick screen share here for folks who do use Mach 3. I have my Mach 3 screen here. This is the demo. I have not applied my license to it on this computer. But here in Mach 3, I would load my G-code. My G-code would be displayed here. The tool path would be displayed over here. Right down here, I have feed rate. The default when you first start Mach 3, for some reason, it sits at six units per minute. Um, whether And then you set whether that's inches or millimeters. Uh, all I have to do is hit the uh, this up arrow, the plus, and each time I click it, it will increase the feed rate by 10%. If you're watching over here, I'm up to 210%. And it goes up by 10% each click. Now, it will go up to 300%. That's the limit for Mach 3. And you can see I've gone from 6 to 18. Now, I can adjust faster or I can adjust slower by just hitting the down arrow. And if I want to go back to the default, what it was, what the feed rate that's listed here in the uh, G code, I just hit reset and it takes me back down to a hundred percent or brings me back up to a hundred percent. Now, by the same token, if I had a spindle on my machine that was controlled by Mach 3, I could increase the RPM here, the spindle speed, or I could decrease the RPM here, or I can reset it back to 100%. So that's how I would do it in Mach 3. Your software, if you're not using Mach 3 or Mach 4, your software is going to be different. So uh, check with, again, check with your machines manufacturer. If it's one of those proprietary controllers like something like uh, Laguna or uh, ShopBot has, check with them. Um now, Bob Frail here says uh, the shark by next wave automation only allows a reduction. Um, I, have you talked to them about that? And um, if you haven't, I would. Um, are you sure is what I'm getting at? There may be a way. They just don't like to publicize it because they don't want people to get in there and do it. So. Uh, let's see, um, uh, Dan Gora says, uh, I've done it in, on open builds in G sender, uh, universal G code sender. Is that the one you're talking about, Dan? See, I don't know. I don't know anything other than the software that I've used and I've always used Mach three always. So I'm, I'm not sure what controllers will do that and what controllers won't do it. So. Uh, Douglas, you must have joined a little bit late. Uh, can you explain overlapping vectors? That's going to be in the next video in this series. Um, I'm not guaranteeing it's going to be next week. In fact, it probably won't be next week, but it'll be sometime in the next couple of weeks. So that, uh, I'm going to do a video of its own. Uh, that and, uh, well, I take that back. I'm going to try to do the overlap vectors and tool pathing in the same video, unless it's just running too long. If it's going to be a, an hour long video, I'll split it. You know, I, I know some of my videos are 45, 50 minutes long. That's too long for me too, because I'm the guy that has to edit it and then go do the closed captioning for it. So I'm going to try to back away from the hour long videos here. So, but it, it'll, it, that will be the subject of the next video. So let's see here. 
Um, okay, Bob says, yes, I'm sure on reduction only. So I set a higher feed rate in Vectric than start at 50% and increase. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, so it'll let you reduce the speed before you start the actual carve and then increase it back up to 100% as it's cutting. That's interesting. You know, for every limitation, I'm telling you, you guys are brilliant. For every limitation, you're going to find a workaround. <laughs> it's just the case. So... I mean, if you, if you, if your controllers are um, limited to reduction only, Bob Frail just gave you the answer. Uh, let's see, uh, RB Woodwork. Do you mean offset rather than overlapping? Uh, no. Again, let's try not to get ahead of ourselves more next week. Okay, let's see. Um, Joe says, thanks for introducing epoxy inlays. Just double my frustration. No, I'm not. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I'm not. Okay, let me throw something at you, Joe. As I said with my um, discussion with Shane and uh, Rob, and they tended to agree with me, this is not a beginner's project. Now, they do, they do not have to be epoxy inlays do not have to be that intricate something i didn't show let me see if i still have them on this computer um i believe i do let me look yes i do um shane and rob and a few other people now that have come to light um they do very intricate epoxy inlays but they don't have to be intricate let me bring this photo up and here's an example of that rob makes these little snack tray platters with epoxy inlays in them and now he used oak shane didn't like oak he told me he didn't like oak at all but rob did use them and these are little snack trays for you know chip and dip what have you and there's the epoxy inlay up above, but it's just one color. And I think that's fantastic. So something like that would probably be a good first attempt at an epoxy inlay. And there's another one there. I really like this walnut with the uh, marbled white with that mica powder in there. That's really cool looking. But it's a very simple design but it'll kind of get you into doing this because one of the things that Shane and Rob were both talking about, especially with something like this is when you carve away a lot of material like this you, for the grab handles or this, you know, area down here and then carve this pocket out. One of the byproducts of the epoxy curing is heat. And you will have, they both said, you will have warpage. So doing something like this and doing a few of them would get a person's, um, get a person used to how to deal with that warpage and how to better, how to, how to better handle uh, warping and twisting, what have you. So I could see pouring this in something like, you know, uh, six quarter lumber, something that's like um, a, a, an inch and an eighth to an inch and a quarter thick, cutting this, pouring the epoxy. And then once this cures, bring it back and make and you know surface it again, do these carves here so that everything is nice and flat. Let it warp before you do a lot of work to it, then machine it flat again to eliminate that warpage then come back and do these cuts and then do your final profile. So they don't have to be intricate. And in fact, I was going to do my logo first because it's three colors. That they're very large areas and it's a very simple 
first project. I was going to cut that and put it up on the wall behind me here. But I got going with this pirate and basically talked myself into cutting the pirate first. So, you know, that's going to be my first uh, attempt. So. <laughs> okay. Um, now, uh, Jeff. Um, let's see. Jeff Woody one says I've used SVGs from different websites and found that they downloaded or download and import perfectly. They were simple logos, but work fine. Perhaps your logo is just too complicated. And that's, that was kind of sort of my point. It was not to say don't use SVG files. It was to say, check them out first. Um, that not all SVG files are created equally. Now, let me share screen again here, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. That messed up NVG, uh, NVG that messed up SVG that I showed in the video, when I open it up here in Chrome, that's the SVG file. It loaded just fine. But you saw it here in Aspire when I let's uh, turn that off, make this active and turn it on. You see what it looks like. Because again, this SVG file was not designed for CNC. This was designed for um it's an online graphic and the web browser can decode all of the information letting it know the uh the the width and intensity of the strokes and what color the fills are and what layer set on top of what so that when you load it in uh, when i load it in the web browser and you can see that it is that svg file when I load it in the web browser, it comes up perfect. It displays perfectly. Now, if the SVG file was created for um, CNC or laser, the person who drew the uh, SVG knows that this type of an SVG file is unusable. They've already taken care of all of those issues. So I'm not saying don't use an SVG file. What I'm saying is not all SVG files are created equally. So, you know, if you have an issue like this, you know, it's a case of, well, there's your problem. So uh, let's see, go back to that, and then I'll stop screen sharing. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, SVG is a it, SVG is a perfectly acceptable um, file format, just like EPS is and uh, DXF files. They're they're all acceptable formats, just that they're not all created equally, and not all DXF files are created equally either. I've had some, I've imported some that were three D DXF files. And I didn't know that. So I had vectors, say, of the outline of a shape. Then I had vertical vectors running to the bottom side and then another profile outline. And oh boy, was that a mess. What I had to do was go back into CAD software. I used NanoCAD. I used to use um, DraftSight, but they've gone to the... Um, They've gone to uh, the monthly subscription thing. It's no longer free. So I use NanoCAD. I had to go back and uh, get rid of all those other vectors and then just import what I was looking for. So, okay, let's see here. Let me go back up here. Uh, let's see. Reload and Shoot says, my win CNC allows increase and reduction in feed rate, spindle speed, laser power. Yes, um, there's a laser module, I believe, for Mach 4. I may be wrong on that. That will let you adjust laser power, but I don't know about Mach 3. There are a lot of plugins for Mach 3. 
that uh, I have never used. So I don't know. Uh, and Planet CNC also has uh, plus and minus on feed and spindle C. Yeah, a lot of them will allow you to do that. My main thing is I, I have a real hard time with people trying to give a cut and dried, this is the feed rate and this is the speed you should use. Because, you know, I just spent, what, five minutes talking about not all SVG files are created equally. Wood is a natural product. It's a natural thing. And I have had like a piece of maple that's been two different densities at two different ends. I mean, you can come across some hard maple that is, I mean, just absolutely rock hard and then kind of have a soft spot, softer spot in the middle. Wood density varies throughout the tree. So I go ahead and I set a rather conservative, modest feed rate, but that doesn't mean that that's what I'm going to end up machining at. My, my default is usually... Uh, if you look at most of my feed rates, is um, is uh, 60 inches per minute. But I may end up doing the cut at 160 inches per minute. It's just going to depend on the wood. So I start slow or conservative, and then I start bumping it up as I see how it's cutting. And I get a little bit of chatter. I'll back it off till that chatter goes away, and that's what it runs at. So. You know, there is no magic number is what I'm getting at. Okay. I think this is, I don't know if this is Haybor C, Haybo RC or something else. Uh, I was asking any problems that epoxy bleeds into the wood. Um, as Shane talked about in the last uh, live stream last week, Yes, that does happen. Uh, and so he will use, he will do a clear fill. Just brush it on, not fill up the pocket, but just brush it on to seal that wood. But that is something that actually needs to be done whether you're going to be using an epoxy fill or paint. Because let's think about this. Every time that bit cuts into the surface of that material, if it's wood, Everywhere that bit has cut, you have just created end grain. And end grain is going to absorb any kind of liquid with the exception of like alcohol. But it's going to absorb that liquid, whether it be an oil base or a water-based paint, stain, um, ink, whatever. So that end grain is just going to suck it up. And that's where you get bleed through. Folks who paint their V carvings will clear coat it after the carve to prevent that, to seal that end grain so the paint or stain or ink doesn't bleed into that grain. So um, it's, it's more or less the same thing with epoxy. Yes, it will bleed. So, but that's, we're going to get into that a little bit further in future videos as well as um, Shane and Rob are going to come back. I was going to save this for the end of the uh, show, but what the heck, we're half an hour in. I'll just talk about it now. Shane and Rob will be back. We're, um, we're arranging and scheduling the day. And because of Rob's schedule, it will again be at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. He gets out of a regular standing Sunday appointment at a roughly noon. It takes him a little while to get home. So on the days that uh, they are going to be my guests, um, we'll start at 1 p.m. Uh, and the next episode that Shane and Rob are going to join me, it's going to be 100% your questions. It's going to be 100% question and answer I'll have a few files loaded up and so will Shane and so will Rob just in case there is something that needs to be demonstrated, but they will be back 
And in fact, Shane would like to make it a regular thing. And I'm all for it. I'm here to tell you what. Um, it won't be every week, but uh, because he's got things he's got to do. And I've got things I've got to do as well as other topics. So um, Lewis Denton says, uh, are you clear coating with an epoxy material? The same epoxy you would pour. The same epoxy you would pour if it was color. The only difference being you're just brushing a little bit on to seal up that grain. Now, let me back up and regroup on that. There are times that Shane will fill the whole pocket with clear. This is especially true, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, if you're carving into end grain. This is, as he has said a few times, there have been times where he's done the carve, poured clear epoxy in, and it's all sucked all the way through an end grain cutting board. And uh, he talked about one time where uh, basically the cutting board got epoxy to the kitchen table because he didn't know that. So I'll get him to go further into that because there are certain things that he does. But basically it's just brushing a little bit of the epoxy in there to seal that all up and then go in and start pouring the color. So, all right, let's see. Um, let's see here. Okay, Jim Brown brings up a good subject here. Thanks for today's video, doing a steam train. Tried to do the smooth oval, not noticing any difference. Um, trying to create a smooth oval uh, without getting too technical into it. There are a lot of times where if I've got a circle, a rectangle, an oval, I'll just draw a new one and delete the old vectors. Um, especially true with circles because there are times where I'll have like a, I'll import some vectors and there's a six inch diameter circle. But if I select that circle and click on node editing, there's like 500 points when there doesn't need to be that many. There needs to be four. So I'll just draw another circle and delete that original. Um, I've done that with ovals as well. So um, not noticing any difference. Maybe that's as smooth as that oval is going to get. I mean, that's possible. Let's see here. Uh, say, Mark, please post the link to that SVG pirate after this. Thanks. It is in this morning's video. There's a link to the pirate uh, both the black and white and the color version. And all you have to do on either one is click that big green button right underneath the image that says download the SVG. And there you go. Yeah, but there is a link. I'll go ahead. I thought I put them in the description of this video, but I'll make sure that it is here. But it is in this morning's video. There's the uh, black and white color version and the skull that I the skull and crossbones that I replaced. Uh, so, you know, let's see. Um, you guys are asking a lot of epoxy questions. You have to remember that I haven't done it yet. I've done a little bit of epoxy work, but I have not done the epoxy inlay yet. <laughs> so my experience with epoxy is limited. Okay, I see Les Clemens wants to know, will that SVG work in a 3D printer? I have no clue. I don't have a 3D printer. I really have no idea. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to go back up. Uh, lots of people's recommending, um, recommending different epoxies. Okay, yeah, Dan uh, Gora says, my epoxy inlay didn't work because I think it was an inch and a half thick. And, you know, it, your mileage may vary. And that's the same thing with anything and anybody. It, your, your experience may be completely different. I mean, if it didn't warp, great. So um, let's see here. Okay, good 
pointer here, Joe. Rob and I talked yesterday on my issue. He recommended always mix the epoxy by weight, not volume. I have heard that as well when it comes to certain specific epoxies. I've heard that with, um, oh my gosh, I'm not going to mention any brand names because I'll probably get it wrong. Uh, but I've heard that there are a couple of brands that it's better to measure by weight and not by volume. So uh, let's see. Going back up here. B -d -d -d. Let's going back to, I think I have caught up with all the others back up above. So let me go back down here to the bottom and see what's going on. And speaking of one of the devils, there's Rob uh, at his YouTube channel, Just Generations Custom Creations. He's putting out some killer videos here lately as well. Um, I, I would go over and um, subscribe to his channel because... He's bringing up some interesting points that I'd not covered and that I'd not really considered, like mapping your tabletop so you know where all the screws, the bolts, the T-tracks are. And that's not something I had really, really considered. So um, I, I, I'm seeing good things come out of his channel, and I know even more are coming. So uh, I would definitely, I would definitely go over and, uh, I mean, there it is right there. That's his YouTube channel, Generations Custom Creations. Head on over to Rob's channel and subscribe because he's got some good stuff coming. So, and please do keep it coming, Rob. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Russell Faraday says, just done one. I've just done first color epoxy inlay. I mixed the epoxy, painted the pocket with it clear, then added and mixed the color and poured it. Seems to have worked very well. That's more or less what uh, Shane and Rob do as well, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, let's see here. Rick French says, I used some clear epoxy for the first time this week. Have gained the courage watching last week's show. Wizards like Rob and Shane make it look easy. But with you guys saying that you have also kind of dipped a toe in it and everything, I'm, uh, I'm um, more encouraged about this. So let's see here. Kind of get back down here. Whip, what was that? Um... Let's see here. If you have time, can you show how to say set six circles the same distance apart in a row, center to center? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's sure. That's that's fairly easy. Let me open up a new session of Aspire before I do that. Um, you're looking at a linear array, and um, I did do a video on linear arrays. It's kind of old, out of character here. I'm, nah, never mind. I will too. I'll put a link to it. Uh, linear array. I'll put a link to it in the, vi in the description of this video as soon as we're done live here. Uh, let me get a piece of material set up here. And um, then I'll come back. Back over to you guys, share my screen. All right, now you specifically asked for six inches apart. Um, I mean, the measurement doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, it works the same whether you're going a half inch apart or six inches apart, okay? What you'll want to do is you'll want to draw your first circle where you want it. So. Let's say I have, uh, I've got a one inch circle here. Okay. One inch diameter circle. 
And I know I want it right. I want it put at my uh, X2. Okay, no, my no, my X negative two. Come on, Mark. I got to reach around a microphone to get to this keyboard. And Y negative two. That will be down here. And one inch diameter, create it, boom. There's my, uh, there's my first circle. Now I want to make a series of four of these. And I want them, eh, let's say, four inches apart on center. Center to center. I want four inches apart, four inches apart, four inches apart. I'll select that circle and do a linear array. Okay. Now it's telling me that my selected object is one inch by one inch. Yes, it is. I want two rows in Y, meaning I want this one and this one. I want two columns in X, here and here and here and here. I want to space them offset four inches this just happened to be in there wow it must be the last one i want a four inch offset copy boom there you go i have four of them let's close that and get out my measuring tool go to the center of this circle click go to the center of this circle and we can see they are four inches apart. Then I can go to, from the center of this circle to the center of this circle. They are four inches apart. The only difference in what I just did and what you asked for was I used a one-inch diameter circle and made them four inches apart. You would just simply, now let me select that back, go back. You would set six inches and however many columns in x you want and however many rows in y you want those are the main things just rows columns offset or gap now if you look over here at the spacing it's showing the offset if i choose gap that's the gap between them from edge to edge. Okay. You want the offset. Okay. So that was kind of a brief thumbnail of it. And John, did that answer your question? So. Okay. Let's see. Boy, a lot of people getting seriously into this. Uh, this epoxy stuff and you're way over my head. <laughs> uh, Bob Hill house. I have heard that same thing besides using epoxy for fill and carving. It's wonderful for gluing up teak when you're doing countertops. Teak is one of those woods that is just oily as heck. Um, and in fact, I know it used to be a big thing. Uh, back in the furniture and cabinet shop days, whenever we worked with teak, you always wiped it down with mineral spirits. I mean, cleaned it like, cleaned it to within an inch of its life. You wiped it down with mineral spirits, spirits and then we used the old school resource and all glue, which you had to mix up and do all that other garbage with. And whenever a teak job came in, we just, because uh, it was a major, major pain. Give us redwood or cedar any day. But um, excellent point. That is true. So let's see here. Um, let's see here. Lots of questions about mixing. Lots of uh, questions about the different types of uh, epoxy. And uh, Steve, Steve M. Potter makes an excellent point. 
RE expansion or contraction, the slower epoxy sets, the fewer problems you have. And that is simply because it doesn't create as much heat as it cures. Um, I use stone coat countertop epoxy, or I have used in the past, and it's made for pores of an eighth of an inch or thinner. And it is, um, it's a slow set epoxy. It has to sit overnight to cure. And um, talking with, they're 20 miles away, so I can bother them at my leisure. Uh, they have all said that, yes, after 24 hours, you can route it. And they do it quite commonly. So, all righty. I think we can go ahead and start wrapping it up. There are, um, I didn't think, I bet, I bet, Rob, you didn't think you were going to uh, get flooded with questions for popping in. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Lewis Denton, are cure times long enough to paint a clear coat then mix colors from the same batch? Usually not because you'll want that clear coat to cure. And if it's going to cure, you know. Um, now, it's, again, this is not a fast process. If you're looking at having this done in a day or two, that's not going to, the only way that's going to happen is if you're using one color, maybe two. Um, you're just not going to get it finished in one day because every pore has to cure before you can route into it. So you spend more time waiting on that epoxy to cure than you do any actual machining. So, and I'm going to talk about that as we progress through this. Rick French, you are the man. Thank you very, very much for that super chat. I really do appreciate it. You guys just absolutely rock. So, um, Gatsby is asking, is there a way to calculate the volume of epoxy you need for a carving? Yes, I do not know what that way is. That's coming in a future video as well from me. I'm sure Rob or Shane could both answer that question. I just don't know the answer to it. Okay, um, let's see. Next week, the video, please don't quote me on this because things do happen. Next video is going to be on tramming the Gatton CNC and uh, getting it all set up after the move. And um, after that, I'm not 100% certain where I'm going to go. That might be... Um, that might be when um, I do the next part of this series, the uh, epoxy inlay. But one way or another, we'll get it all together. I've got a lot of videos down the pike. I'm going to be doing uh, a tiling video. I've been asked for that a lot. Um, going to be doing some more rotary axis work, things of that nature. Um, yes, Bob, I did miss that. Thank you very much. When doing a pocket for epoxy inlay, how can you find the volume of the pocket? I, again, I know there's a way to do it. I do not know right off the top of my head how to do that. I will put that in a future video. I know there's a way to do it. I don't know it off the top of my head. So, um, okay, there we go. Uh, control alt shift V search the vectric forum for the details. Okay. There you go. If you are not a member of the vectric support forum and you use vectric software, you are doing yourself a disservice. Get over to the support forum and register and just browse through it. I mean, if you go up to the search bar and you type in just about any subject you can think of, believe me, you are not the first person to have that question. And believe me, you will not be the last person to have that question. It has probably been answered over there or maybe in the process of being discussed. That's um, go over to Vectric's website and look for the link that forum is the link. 
click on that, register, sign up. And uh, there are some absolute wizards with this software over there. Some pure 100% guaranteed artists with this software over there. And they have helped me out a lot in the past, believe me. Um, but um, that's what Brooks is saying. Search the Vectric forum for the details. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, here, uh, this last one here from Joe. Learn the hard way. If you try to carve epoxy and it is gummy, it's not cured enough. True. Even waited two days. Must have messed up the mix. There are a lot of variables. It could have been a wrong ratio. It could have been uh, an incomplete mix. Uh, maybe you didn't stir it long enough or well enough. I mean, there's. I mean, it could have been reaction with some sort of a tint or color. There's uh, moisture in the wood. It could be. I mean, there's a ton of different variables. Maybe it just wasn't hot enough. So. And Jack Matson, um, you know, a hundred percent correct. And that's why I don't really get into specifics. There are different types of epoxy that need to be mixed exactly as directed from the manufacturer, or it will be messed up. These are the people who make the product. They've done the research and development. You don't have to tinker and experiment. They've already done that. If you mix it up the way they say to mix it up, you shouldn't have an issue. That being said, you can still have an issue. Another thing that needs to be stated is epoxy does have a shelf life. If it's a couple of years old, dispose of it properly and get some new. And that's all there is to it. I mean, you know. Okay, so let me go ahead and back on out of here. Like I said, next week we're going to, I'll be talking about tramming my uh, router head, possibly surfacing the spoilable, spoil board. And we're going to run from there. Um, so until next week, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Les. I'm still having some issues have a uh, appointment coming up uh, Wednesday. Got to do an, another adjustment. It's um, there are some issues, but uh, they just don't fit right. And that's common for temporary, but thank you very much. I do appreciate that. And with that being said, um, thank you for joining me. Thank you to everybody uh, who has hit those donation links down in the description of these videos. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you for the super stickers. Lewis Denton, you are the man. Thank you very, very much. And until next week, have a good day. Go do something cool. Go out and make some chips. Sheesh, don't hang around inside. Well, you guys back east, you have to. Snow. <laughs> have a good one, y'all. Take care.